the uh, next of the uh, screencasts about uh, counting ratios. Uh, we switched over to video this time, so here's where you get to the material that we're aiming for. Go to learning modules, head down to more on accounting, and there should be uh, an extra little pop-up for Yahoo Finance, but I'm getting us back to Blackboard. And you go right there to accounting ratios. And that should be the uh, PDF that we've been working with uh, on class. It'll also be the PDF, uh, the front cover that you'll have of your uh, packet for the exams. And so, uh, apparently I haven't done this before. There we go. Now, we previously talked about the inventory turnover ratio, total asset turnover, and accounts receivable turnover. We're going to be skipping profit margin on sales right here. Um, because we'd like to focus on the following three. Um, so what we're going to be looking at now are going to be return on total assets, return on common equity, and the price earnings ratio. Now, the reason why these are going to interest us so much is because that these three all look like an interest rate. They all represent uh, the opportunity cost of time from slightly different points of view and slightly different kinds of uh, assumptions about how preferred stocks are going to be treated. So focus for the first part on just the numerator that you have here. So here you have earnings before interest in taxes. Now remember, this is one of the, the subheadings that you'll find on the income statement. This is going to be... Now, contrast that earnings before interest in taxes with what you have here in the numerator for the return on common equity. Okay? What you have on the top of the return on total assets is the product of the firm before any of the ownership structure is taken into account. You got to remember that you know dividends get paid after interest in taxes, and firms have interest when they have borrowed money, debt. And so what you're looking at with the amount of interest that's there is some description of that asset structure. How much of their expansion was funded by equity and how much was actually funded by debt. And what you're trying to do with the earnings before interest in taxes is get a view of the firm holding those things constant before you take those into account. Now, what we've done with the return on common equity is we've moved past it a little bit. We've knocked off the interest, we've knocked off the taxes, and we got down to what it is that's going to be distribu distributed to the common equity holders. But we have to make sure that we still treat those preferred shareholders. And so what we're doing is, is we're knocking off uh, all the dividends those preferred shareholders receive. And so what's sitting there on the top is the amount that's available to be distributed to the common shareholders as dividends if the firm had decided to do that. Remember, they don't normally do that. They usually keep a nice big chunk there and retain earnings for expansion. Now, further contrast, take a look at what is down in the denominator. Now, these are both uh, measures of productive assets. We have the total assets here, and below is a combination of things which all together add up to what is being owned by the common shareholders. The return on total assets has all the assets there, no matter who owns them. And so this is effectively from the firm's point of view. It doesn't care necessarily who owns the assets. This is what it has available to it. And this is what it goes ahead and produces as far as value every single year with those assets that the firm itself owns. When you're looking at the return on common equity, to this all together represents what the common shareholders own. Remember that common stock is supposed to be um, the uh, stock at par value. The retained earnings are supposed to be all those accumulated net income that haven't been distributed as dividends. And the capital surplus is the amount that you sold the common stock for above and beyond its par value. So what you're seeing from the return on common equity is the amount of revenue that's generated for the common shareholders from that group of assets that they actually own. Now, if you think about these things from two different points of view, this return on total assets is what you get to produce and the opportunity cost from the point of view of the firm. And what you have from return on common equity is the opportunity cost from the uh, point of view of the common shareholder. 
Now, I say these things are opportunity costs because if you look at these right here and you calculate them, they look an awful lot about interest rates. In other words, it represents if, for example, on the return on total assets, you took an extra dollar and you bought an asset with it, what kind of earnings you would expect with that dollar. So if you get a return on total assets of, say, 0 0.07, you know that if you actually took an extra dollar and bought the kinds of assets that you usually get, you know that you could get about seven cents out of it. Now, the return on common equity is from a slightly different point of view. It's not just any dollar that gets thrown in. It has to do with the dollar that is being contributed by one of these common shareholders. An usual way of thinking about it is keeping the dollar in the firm rather than distributing it out as dividends. And so this is what happens for the common shareholder's dollar, the dollar that they have a right to, if the firm goes ahead and purchases the things that it normally does with those dividends that aren't distributed. So again, return on total assets is the opportunity cost, time value of money for uh, purchases from the point of view of the firm. The return on common equity is the opportunity cost from the point of view of the current common shareholders. Now this leads us to this last element right down here, was the, which is the price earnings ratio. Now, you normally hear about the price-earnings ratio. You talk about being high and low, and 20 is supposedly a high price-earnings ratio, and 12 supposedly a low price-earnings ratio. Um, and if you flip it upside down, it turns into something which is more comparable with the other two measures that we have above. If you flip it upside down and turn it into not a price-earnings ratio, but an earnings-price ratio, you see it is like an interest rate. You can treat it similar to what you do this return on total assets and return on common equity. It is, it's the earnings per share. Similar to what you see up here in the numerator for the return on common equity, that net income less preferred dividends, that's actually earnings for all the common shareholders. What you have as the earnings per share is that same number divided by the number of common shares outstanding. It's modified just a little bit because the shares outstanding can be kind of a, a, a twitchy number. What's different is what you have down here as what's producing all those benefits. Note in the return for common equity, you have the common stock, the retained earnings, and the capital surplus. And that's like the accountant point of view on what the assets are worth. And you're thinking about those as those are oftentimes just the purchase price or the current market price for those individual assets. What you have on the price earnings ratio is the current price of the stock. And so it's what the firm is worth all put together. And so you can see that that base is kind of a, a larger number for most operating firms than that common stock plus retained earnings plus capital surplus multiplied by the number of shares that's hanging around out there. So you can think about this earnings price ratio, and please note I'm talking about the inverse, as the opportunity cost of money from a potential owner of the stock. So again, what we're looking at here is the opportunity cost of time from three different points of view. The return on total assets is the point of view of the firm itself. The return on common equity is the point of view of a current shareholder. And the earnings price ratio, again flipped upside down, is the opportunity cost of time from the point of view of a potential shareholder. And this should end the last of the screencasts on accounting.